In July 2016, Safe Coalition NC began a community engagement process focused on helping the Charlotte Black community reduce violence and other harms it endures. The purpose of the meeting was to introduce the Humphrey's own idea to a design team which would help design the community engagement process. This video is part two of a four-part series giving some background information about the project. Early in the meeting, Robert Dawkins gave the design team a short review of the sources of community harm that the project intends to focus on. What we want to do tonight is introduce terms that some of you are familiar with and others may not have heard. Uh, the principles behind what's called a harm-free zone. So the harm-free zone as a concept uh, brings together a lot of things that face our community. All of the things that we can classify as social harms. So whether it's institutional harm, which is being done to us by the police, by the judicial system, uh, uh, other institutions, those are one component of social harms that we face in our neighborhood. Another one that uh, leads to crime, violence, and uh, disagreements, of course, in the neighborhood is community norms. So that's another type of social harm that we want to address through this community norm. And also, uh, finally, uh, family empowerment and healing. So we can define that as what happens as a result to the family, to the black community, as a result of uh, institutional harm, and as a result of uh, failing community norms. You know, things like how we get along and how we interact with each other uh, in our neighborhoods, which also is an issue. So what we tried to do is we tried to put together a brief overview. is isn't your job to read it today, but hopefully uh, you will take it and you will read it on the actual framework for uh, harm-free zones. Uh, harm-free zones are not new. So Corinne did mention Seattle. And Seattle was a city that tried to adopt a harm-free zone. And their processes are, were the same as what you'll find in the sheet. The problem was with Seattle's model was that Seattle was pretty much white-led. It was pretty much uh, black elite-led. And the only way that the harm-free zone works as far as any processes is if us as individuals may be able to design it but it's got to be, that's for us to just incubate. It's got to be run and it's got to be led and it's got to be made up of the members of the community that it's trying to uh, uh, bring about reform in. Uh, the two most successful harm-free zones, one is uh, critical resistance out of New York, which is the framework that we're using right here. And another one is actually a local project here in, uh, in uh, Durham, in that Spirit House. And both of those have had uh, some pretty good success in, are still in the build in the building stage now. Critical resistance has been doing harm free zones now for around 15 years. Uh, Spirit House has been I think they're in their eighth year of it, um, and they're designed around what those communities ask for. Some are like Spirit House is led by an art collective, you know, so that's their stuff is framed in uh, not only ending the prison industrial complex, but it's headed up by people in the neighborhood that are are based in art. Uh, the one in, in with critical resistance is more uh, community activism model. So there's what Dr. Camp is going to do after we talk about it is take all of the things that we are talking about in design, compare that to different models, compare that to other models in restorative justice. Uh, we've started collections of surveys. Uh, we're going to be surveying uh, the neighborhoods and we know from talking to Gary, talking to the police chief, that the highest crime rates right now as far as serious crime was uh, Freedom, Metro, and North. North. Is that right? So those are three areas that we will be out uh, surveying to get the people's opinions on what they prioritize as the issues in their neighborhood. 